Hi, I'm John Stevenson. We're going to be looking at a story of three widows as we begin a study of the book of Ruth, beginning Ruth chapter 1. If we look at our English Old Testament, of course, it begins with the Pentateuch, that's Genesis through Deuteronomy, and then the historical books, Joshua all the way to Esther. Uh, next come the poets, and then finally the prophets. The book of Ruth is one of those books in the historical books. That is in our English Bible. That changes when we look at a Hebrew Bible. Again, we start off with the Pentateuch, or they call it the Torah, the books of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy. But then there are the Navi'im, what we would call the prophets, and that goes from Joshua to Malachi. But Ruth isn't in the prophets, uh, even though we go Joshua, Judges, Samuel, where we would expect to see the book of Ruth. Instead, we find the book of Ruth in the writings, the Kethuvim, just means the writings, and Ruth is wedged there between Sol the Song of Solomon and Lamentations, between a book about marriage and joy and a book about mourning and sorrow. We have this little tiny book, the book of Ruth. The reason it is found there is because the, the book of Ruth is one of five books that make up what are called the Megaloth, the, that, that is the scrolls. These scrolls were used at certain times of the year and they were used for liturgical reasons. For example, at Passover they would read the Song of Solomon. At Lamentations they would read uh, the Fall of Jerusalem that commemorates, you know, Lamentations sort of commemorates that. Uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, during this time for, for a week the Israelites would leave their houses and go out and live in tents. Uh, they would celebrate, the, they would read the book of Ecclesiastes uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, remembering the fact that we live in a bodily tent. We live in a temporary dwelling. We're here today and we're gone tomorrow. Uh, the book of Esther would be read at Purim. It still is today. The book of Ruth, though, notice, is written at Shabbat, uh, that is at Pentecost. And that's going to be significant, uh, first of all, because the story, the bulk of the story takes place around that time of the year. But maybe there's another connection as well. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed. Now the, the Hebrew phrase there, instead of saying when the judges governed, literally it's when the judges judged. Uh, that sounds like bad English, but it's good Hebrew. Uh, and that takes us back, that takes us back to the book of Judges that precedes the book of Ruth. You see, Judges, especially chapters 17 through 21, give us two stories. Uh, it gives us uh, two stories where it says four times in the stories that there was no king in Israel. As we open now the book of Ruth, that begins with a phrase, when the judges judges, hearkening back to the days of, of judges. In Judges chapter 17, it begins with a story of a Levite and a concubine. They're both from Bethlehem. Likewise, as we open here, we're going to see Naomi. We'll be introduced to her in a moment. And her family, they're from Bethlehem. So all three of these stories... The, the story of the Levite, the story of the concubine, the story of Ruth and Naomi, begin in Bethlehem. In Judges, it's going to present the need for a king because there was no king in Israel, and they needed a king. As we get to the end of the book of Ruth, it's going to present the lineage of the king. It's how we got there from here. So it came about in the days when the judges judged, when the judges governed, that there was a famine in the land, and when the famine comes to the land, everything's bad. Uh, and uh, things don't grow. It's an agricultural economy. But there was a certain man of Bethlehem, and when you see that word Bethlehem, Beth is the word for house in Hebrew, and Lachem is the word for bread, so house of bread, or we could call it the bakery. Uh, and and when, there's, when there's a famine in the bakery, that's bad news. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Now notice what's happening. They are leaving Bethlehem. They're leaving the promised land, the, the, the land that God gave them, the land that God placed them in, and they're going to Moab. Moab is outside the promised land. Moab is one of the traditional enemies of the people of Israel. And the book of Judges, they, the Moabites had, had come and invaded and given them all sorts of problems. And because of that ill will both ways, the people of Moab and their neighboring cousins, the Ammonites, 
had been put under a curse. Deuteronomy chapter 23 talks about how no Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall ever enter the, the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt. They had treated Israel, uh, Israel uh, as enemies. Uh, they had hired against you. Uh, notice Balaam, the son of Beor, um, from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. And so now a curse had been put upon them. And that's the place, that's the place where this man and his family leave the promised place of God. They, they leave the promised land and they travel to Moab. Chapter 1, verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech. Uh, uh, El is, is short for Elohim, that's God. And Melech is uh, king. And Eli is, uh, you put the Li part, and that's my God. So my God is king. But he's not acting like God is king. Now, I don't know if he's being especially disobedient, but we're, we're seeing him leave the promised land. Uh, and the name of his wife was Naomi. That's going to be significant, but I'll mention that later on. Uh, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, and they were Ephrathites. That's somebody from the neighborhood of, of Bethlehem. Uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab, and they remain there. They, they leave, and they resettle in this outside land. Verse 3, over the process of time, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Remember, they didn't have social security or welfare or things like that, so, so when a husband died, that was tragic, but not, you know, I mean, it, it could have been worse. She still has her two sons to take care of her. And those two sons, verse 4, they took for themselves Moabite women as wives, because that's all you can find in Moab. Um, and the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. But then, verse 5, but then both Malon and Kilion also died. And the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Notice the story now is going to be told from the perspective of Naomi. She is going to be, at least for this chapter, the key character. Everything will be through her eyes. Uh, yes, that was tragic for Orpah. Yes, that was tragic for Ruth. But it's Naomi that is the center of our focus. So we have three funerals. They didn't happen all at once. Uh, first, we have the death of Elimelech, and then we have the death of Naomi's two sons, and now she has a decision to make. And so there will ultimately be three decisions that are made. First of all, she decides to return to Bethlehem. She hears that the Lord has visited his people. Not that God was on a vacation, but, but in other words, the, the famine has ended. And she decides to return to Bethlehem, and she says to her two daughters-in-law, you might as well stay here. There's, there's nothing for you back there. It's not like I have any children. Even if I was pregnant, you'd, it would take so many years for them to, uh, to be born and then to grow up, and you're not going to wait around. And so go home, go back to your families, and, and get husbands for yourselves, and try to, try to just restart your lives. And Orpah decides to return to Moab, and she does. So she's, she's gone from the story. But Ruth decides to follow Naomi. And in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, she says, But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And here's the significant part. And your God, my God. Notice it's not just a filial connection. It's not just a family connection. That it is also a God connection. It's also a, a theological connection. Your God is going to be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. But, and notice these last words. This, these, this is the language of an oath. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. Notice what she's saying. Till death do us part. I'm with you as long as I live, and if, if, if I leave for any other reason, may I die. That's that's covenant language. That's the sort of language that we use, whether we realize it or not. It's the sort of language that we use at a wedding. When we say, until death do us part, we're saying, may I die if, if I leave for any other reason. If people understood the seriousness of marriage, maybe our marriages would, would last a lot longer. Well, in verse 19, they both went until they came to Bethlehem. So here they're finally back. And when they had come to Bethlehem, and remember that a number of years had passed. They'd been living 10 years uh, with those husbands, but also maybe some time before that. 
Uh, and they came to Bethlehem, and all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, now I'm sure the men said things too, but we, our, our camera is on the women. And the woman said, is this Naomi? And now you need to know the significance of the name. Because the name Naomi means pleasant, or if you want, beautiful. But she's going to say something about that name. In verse 20, she says to them, Naomi says to them, do not call me Naomi. Remember, that's, that's pleasant or beautiful. Don't call me a beauty. <laughs> and they're asking, is this Naomi? And, uh, because after all, they haven't seen her for a bunch of years. And you know how it is when you haven't seen somebody for a bunch of years. They change. And, it's, and sometimes it's not just the years. Sometimes if someone said, it's the mileage. And, and she's gone through a lot of mileage. She's had lots of loss. She's had lots of sorrow. And she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me beautiful. Call me Mara. Mara. For the Almighty has dealt in a Mara way with me. He has Mara'd me. And the word Mara means bitter. Call me bitter because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Why do you call me pleasant? Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. She's, she's blaming God. She's saying God was in control. And you know, there's a sense in which, remember, that when bad things happen, God is in control. I, I don't think it's necessarily that her theology is, is all wrong. God is in control, but she's, she can only see a portion of the story. She hasn't seen how the story is going to end. And that's, that's the case with us, too. When we're going through difficult times, we cannot see how the story is going to end. And so, and so in verse 22, so Naomi returned, and with her Ruth the Moabitess, notice how that's mentioned again, it's going to be mentioned a number of times. Um, we're not going to forget that Ruth is not just Ruth. She's Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem. And notice how the chapter ends. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, where I live in the United States, we think of harvest in the fall time. But that's not the case in Israel. In Israel, um, the winter time is the place where you have the rainy season, and that causes the crops to grow. So that the barley harvest is what we would call the early, the early spring, right at the beginning of the, of the re Jewish religious year. In fact, the barley harvest is the time where you would have the Passover. And remember what happened uh, in the New Testament at Passover. That's the time when Jesus died on the cross. He died and was buried and, of course, rose again. And our story begins, at least at this section of it, uh, the chapter 1 ends at the barley harvest around the same time where a thousand years later, Jesus would die and rise from the dead. But when we pick up in the next chapter, we won't be at the barley harvest anymore. Instead, we're going to move forward about a month and a half. And remember, I, I already told you when the book of Ruth was, is traditionally read. It is read at a time called Pentecost. And so we're going to see the time of new life, and, and right now there's hopelessness, but there's going to be hope. And it reminds us a little bit of what happened with Jesus, who died upon the cross. And it looked like hopelessness. Of course, he rose again three days later. But then, a month and a half later, 50 days later, came the Spirit of God and the wedding of the church. And guess what we're going to see in Ruth next time? We're going to see, eventually, a promise of a wedding.